So um, let's now jump in. So let's say that I'm a, treat me as, a, as they say, as a three-year-old uh, Amazon 1P seller. So I'm rec uh, receiving POs from Amazon and I decided, I listened to this episode, came across you, you told me, and I said, okay, fine. What are the, the things? Walk me through step by step. What happens once I make that decision? Yeah, and, and I think, Nick, one of the important things that we, we always start with is it doesn't necessarily need to be an all or none, right? There are cases where Amazon may be doing a better job on certain SKUs, and you shouldn't necessarily just immediately transition those, right? You can live in a world where you're doing a mix of, of, of vendor, so 1P and 3P, in cases where we'd strongly advocate that that transition start happening is where SKUs are either Amazon stops issuing purchase orders for those SKUs, uh, they're not taking a price increase, or they're not giving it the right attention, right? It's not doing as well as it could, or they may be new items where you can start in 3P because you don't want to give up your meal ticket, right? Because that transition can take a little bit of time. Um, and so what we do is we do an evaluation. We help brands understand what it actually means to transition away from 1P to 3P and not upset their vendor manager and not upset that Amazon relationship. Understand what uh, financials look like, right? What do we think the forecast is? What are the fees that are associated with selling as a 3P seller, right? Because now you got to consider... Uh, the all the all the referral fees and you got to consider FBA fees to to move into that and so we build out a model a PL that is bottom up with every SKU in a catalog and then we make that decision to transition we get accounts set up and then we and then we start taking over ownership over those UPCs right so what we want to do is really important is sit on any existing ASINs that are that are there right and we don't want to create new ASINs uh, so we use the same UPCs, we take over ownership, and then we start getting inventory in and, and transitioning away from, from that 1P relationship. Yeah, you know, this reminded me of something. So uh, when I started Argometrics, um, I went to, as you put, 1P sellers, and, and I tried to convince them. And in the process, I had to make the case financial case of why this makes sense and and I created this because I, I love numbers and I, I love creating templates so I created this template that would simply plug in uh, you would plug in the the rank and the, the price point and and everything else and also these were brands that had resellers so they were not in the buy box 100% of the time either right. so uh, I mean, even though because Amazon always dominates the buy box, but nevertheless, inventory situations, blah, blah, it's not 100%. You cannot say it's always. So bottom line, it proved to be after all the FBA fees and everything, the commissions, the fees and, and the storage and, and you name it, they the numbers came out ahead about 60% net. Yeah, yeah. Would you agree with those numbers? Yeah, it's it's typically it's typically quite a better picture for brands. Um, there's a little bit of a spectrum, right? Brands who have experienced selling direct in other channels get it real fast, right? Nick, they're like, I understand what selling at a retail price does for my margins in other places. So on Amazon, it can happen fast. Other brands that we talk to that are a little bit more legacy or have grown up in a more traditional wholesale world have a little bit more trouble getting a handle on this because they don't really sell at retail anywhere else that, you know, they right. make wholesale sale and then they're just like, okay, it's done. So they don't really understand the impact of margin. And, then, and that's, that's a fair point that like, when we do this, we're helping a brand think operationally about this. Right. Cause there's a bunch of components there. Right. Which is like, how do you enforce map pricing? Like, do you police that in other channels? Do you have reseller agreements? Right. Th that could bleed into, do you have resellers on your listings already? Right. Cause you might be selling, to, to Amazon on a 1P basis. But many of the times when we're talking to brands that are transitioning, because they've been selling in a wholesale format, they've often sold to many distributors and they might sell to big box retailers, but then also like small mom and pop regional retailers. And those are often the worst. The, the mom and pop retailers show up on Amazon because there's a lot of them and you get to play whack-a-mole. 
right? right. That's, that's when we have to come in and we have to, you know, we either reach out to those, to those resellers directly and say, look guys, you know, you agree to a map policy that you're not, you're not adhering to, right? So we're going to stop selling to you. Or, you know, we need to bring down, you know, Amazon on their head in the form of an infringement claim, right? Or, you know, an unauthorized seller, in which case, you know, we say, okay, look, that could shut your whole store down, right? And that's a sensitive discussion to have for brands because for some brands, those might be, for example, uh, you know, representative of meaningful sales and other channels, right? Like you could have a, a retail distributor that is that is buying a fair amount of product and you don't want to blow up that relationship over a couple of dollars of sales on Amazon, Right. And, but the mix being that the brand needs to have control over that. So, so that's something to walk through. 